Stay right there in your easy chair For 30 minutes of pleasure Don't you go, it's more than the show It's the talk of the desert It's the talk of the desert with Belinda Reed I just love coming home at night I turn around, she's a treasure Everyone and everywhere I go now, here's Melinda. Well, here we go again with the 23rd annual Jim Cook A Day of Hope for Diabetes at the Annenberg Health Sciences Building on the campus of Eisenhower Medical Center. This is the 18th year that I will emcee this event, and it's a passion for me. And as my audience knows, it's because I have type 1 diabetes since I was three and a half years old and um, I've now lived with it for 57 years I can't even say that 57 years but put your calculators away I admit I'm 60 and a half years old now <laughs> but anyway I want to welcome my guests joining me so we can talk about what's going to happen at the day of hope for diabetes and to my right is Sherry Mason. She's a registered dietitian with the diabetes program here at Eisenhower. Sherry, welcome to Talk of the Desert. We're going to, going to talk about food. Is that oh, good? Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you for yeah. inviting well, me. It's, food is important to everybody. Absolutely. And then we have a new cardiologist at Eisenhower, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce his <laughs> name, Dr. Chanaka Wickaramasinghe. That's did, good enough. Did, That's is that, was that close? That's very good. That's good. Dr. Wick, thank you so much for joining us. And we lovingly call him Dr. Wick. Thank you. Thank you very much Be, for the invite. Because the, because the, the name, when you look at it, you're going to go, I have no <laughs> idea how to pronounce this. So let me give some a little housekeeping stuff here, and then we'll get to both of you. Sure. The Day of Hope for Diabetes is Saturday, March 3rd, starting at 8 o'clock in the morning with a health fair. And then our first speaker will be at 9 a.m. Our second speakers will be at 10 a.m. And then our health care keynote speaker will be at 11 a.m. And we'll talk about who that is in a minute. And then also, you know, I got to sell um, memberships to the Desert Diabetes Club. <laughs> it's only $25 a year per person, or for a couple, it's $40 a year. And then we also have a, a more generous donation that you can, can become. Uh, I think it's $50 a year. But if when you become a member of the Desert Diabetes Club at the Day of Hope, you get a free luncheon. So starting at noon to 12.30, we'll have lunches for you. Besides, then you get a, a information about the monthly meetings that we have, and of course, then the 2019 Day of Hope for Diabetes. You see, I've been doing this, as I said, for 18 years. I can't believe it's getting to be that long. But let's talk to Sherry, because food is so important to all of us. And Sherry, you're gonna be speaking at the Day of Hope. And talk about why food and diabetes, because we all love to eat, and we have to eat, because we need the nutrition and the energy from it. Absolutely, and people with diabetes need to eat as well. Yeah. And unfortunately, <laughs> there's a lot of misconceptions. But, but proper things, right? Yes. <laughs> as we all should. Yes. And so some of the things that I like to um, talk about in my all of my talks is the misconceptions and the myths and the the propaganda that is out there with nutrition mm -hmm. and people with diabetes. So I do like to dispel some of the myths. That's a lot of what I'll be talking about. And um, yes, food is important. What what other questions might you want to ask about that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's so many. A person with diabetes should not sit down and eat a whole birthday cake, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, nobody should do that, correct? <laughs> oh my goodness. So of course not. Um, that wouldn't be healthy eating for anybody. So all of us with diabetes should be eating just as healthy as everybody. And also, Sherry, you have type 1 diabetes. That's correct. And so you're living with it just like I am. That's correct. Every nanosecond of our lives. That's right. How, how, what age were you diagnosed? I was four and a half, So, oh. and I've had it 51 years. Years. Okay, so now we know your age. Yes, you do. <laughs> now, how do you take care of it? Because I take four injections a day. Well, I actually wear a pump right now. I Good do. For you. I do go on and off my pump. I do. I get tired of wearing a pump. I go back to injections. Then I get tired of injections. I go back to my pump, and that is actually what I um, specialize in. Mm -hmm. I love teaching pumps and helping people understand their insulin. And if they do decide to eat some birthday cake, how much insulin to take for it? <laughs> so that that's my that's my passion is. To to help those of us with type 1 because it is so complicated to try right. to manage these blood sugars 
<clears throat> for the type two, it's more about nutrition. Yeah. It's much more about Completely. nutrition, and of course, we always bring the heart into it. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Want, want a healthy heart. Yeah, we all want a healthy heart. Yeah, but right. explain, either one of you, explain the difference between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, because those are the two types that we have right. in our world. Right. So, Dr. I think, you know, type 1 is more, uh, historically speaking, type 1 is more a complete deficiency of insulin. That's why people get it at a young age, and, you know, you require insulin from a very early onset, whereas type 2 is more of an acquired gradual reduction in your insulin levels. In addition to that, there is resistance to insulin. So you have insulin that's being secreted by your body, but your receptors that take it up are a bit resistant to it. So there's two different phenotypes, more later onset, more early onset, and the medications differ, like you guys mentioned. You know, generally type two diabetics are initially managed on oral medications with the transition later towards insulin if things get worse. However, most type ones are diagnosed at much younger ages they require much more aggressive insulin, including pumps and more frequent injections. Anything else you, you think, Sherry, from your aspect? Well, well it, no, you explained it wonderfully. Um, all I could say is, you know, the type one does occur in adults and, and type two occurs in children now. Unfortunately, yeah. the population of children with type two has right. gone up drastically. Because of the diet and the yeah. obesity. The, obe yes. the obesity ep epidemic has shifted the prevalence and the onset of type 2 diabetes significantly. Historically, it was a disease in adults, yeah. overweight, you know, unhealthy adults. Now we are seeing an obesity ep epidemic in this country, actually in, in the Western world, where kids who are a few years old are massively obese, eat junk, don't exercise, and we are seeing more of a recurrence of type 2 diabetes. And explain to our non-people with diabetes why insulin is so important to everybody metabolizes the food we eat, right? So the way I explain it to yeah. patients, I, I simplify it down to, you know, just the simplest possible way that insulin is our fuel pump. And without insulin, you would be dead. You cannot live without it, just like you cannot live without a heart. Mm -hmm. So insulin's job is to convert the fuel to energy. So it takes the fuel, which is the sugar and the fat from the blood, puts it into the cells for energy. So without insulin, where's the fuel going? It's in the blood. And that's where you find it is when it's high in the blood and that's mm -hmm. how diabetes is diagnosed so insulin is absolutely essential for life so the difference like dr wick was saying is the type 2 still produce insulin just right. not quite enough so when they eat food their food can is not being metabolized the way it should the fuel pump isn't working so their blood sugars are elevated from the from food unfortunately so that's why food is more important with the type 2 because they're still producing insulin right Whereas those of us with type 1, it doesn't matter what we eat, we have to take There's insulin. There's no insulin. We have to take it artificially, however yes. we do that, like injections or the pump, and there's some other things that are on the working on the road for, for, for us that live with type 1. But now, Dr. Wick, let's introduce you, because most people don't know who you are here in the desert, right. and they're going to have to get to know right. you. Right, right. Because Dr. Barry Hackshaw, who everybody that I know that saw a cardiologist went to Dr. Hackshaw, right. including my mom, and um, he decided to retire. <laughs> I, what I liked about Dr. Hackshaw is he'd walk into the examining room and say, like, to my mom, oh, how's my girlfriend today? Because right, <laughs> right. a lot of widows in this <laughs> desert, you know? You didn't know that. Did no, you know no, that? Didn't you didn't know that. Know that. Yeah. Well, Dr. Wick, tell us a little bit about your background and why you decided to get into medicine and your travels across the globe to right, be here in right. our desert. So by, by birth, I am from a country called Sri Lanka, which is a small island in South Asia, right below India. A lot of people mistake me for being Indian because we all look alike, but by <laughs> origin, I'm Sri Lankan. But I left when I was about five years old and I moved to Saudi Arabia because my dad worked there for industries. and then. From there, I moved to UK, London. I did my high school and med school in London, UK. And then afterwards, you know, I always thought the forefront of medicine was in the USA. You know, the, the most advances in technology, research, everything was more, you know, more occurring at a more faster pace in the USA. So I decided to move across the ocean and come to the US. But what attracted you to go into medicine? Into medicine, so two things, you know, partly, there was a lot of physicians in my family. 
and it made you know from a very young age I was exposed to medicine yeah, I would hear about them talking about medicine over dinner over get-togethers about patients what they you know interesting cases so I always found it interesting the second thing was in school I always felt I was better at the sciences than economics or math so it felt more natural to pursue that path and then during my residency and training cardiology became a you know it came naturally to me I felt like it was a center of physiology, pharmacology, where everything made sense. You know, we were able to treat somebody, see immediate effects of it. And, you know, that was very fascinating. And that was why I chose to pursue my career down a uh, path of cardiology. And then most recently, before I moved to the desert, I was at UCLA. I did my training at UCLA in Los Angeles. And then, you know, I heard Dr. Hackshaw was retiring and I had, you know, put out my resume to see if there was any jobs out in the suburbs. And he reached out to me, and the rest is history. Well, and part of that is because you have a young child, right? And you don't right. want to raise him in in Los Angeles. Los Angeles so <laughs> exactly. And so, how how did Dr. Hackshaw find you to replace his position here at Eisenhower? You're gonna to have to ask him that question. <laughs> okay. Do you know why he chose you? He, I guess, he saw something in me. <laughs> well, I know your nurse, Mary Lou. Uh, when I took my mom to the into the last appointment with you, she says, "What uh, just when she just walked out of the room?" She, he says, she, "She said, you know, Dr. Wick's the best." She's so, very kind. <laughs> so you pay her a lot, is that right? I do. I pay her under the table a lot of money. Good <laughs> things about. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was your transition like from UCLA here to Eisenhower Medical so, Center? So, uh, I think the biggest difference was the patient population. You know, UCLA, inner city, big, Los Angeles the average age of the patient was much less. Uh, you know, patients were, a lot of patients were non-compliant. They didn't have a good understanding of their disease. You know, they would not keep up with their appointments. Uh, and we would get, being a tertiary referral center, we would get very end stage sick patients. Mm -hmm. So it was very acute cardiac care. Whereas my patient population here is very educated, for the most part. They're oh, very in tune with their medications. They know a lot about their health. They know a lot about diabetes, their cardiology. They are interested in taking an active role in looking after their health. And that, as a physician, makes it very easy to look after them because if they understand their disease and they're interested in learning it and you know working with you to get better, it makes your life a whole lot better. Well, that's what I would say about, that's why we have the Day of Hope for Diabetes every year here at the Annenberg Center. Um, because we want people who live with diabetes, you've got to be actively involved with right. the disease. Right. You have to actually be your own doctor. Right. And so, I mean, don't you agree, yes. Sherry? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Now, how many blood tests do you do a day? Well, I wear a sensor. Oh, you do? Okay. So it's, you know, every five minutes. Um, so testing the blood with a sensor is, you know, a couple times, maybe three times a day. But if you're not wearing a sensor, I recommend for those on insulin a minimum four times a day. Minimum. Minimum. And that's still not enough information. And because diabetes affects every part of our bodies, I mean everything, every cell in our body. But a heart disease and heart attacks is one of the problems with the complications of the diabetes. Right. And that's where you come in, right. Dr. Wick. Exactly. That's one of the most common complications from long long-standing diabetes. And is because, like Sherry mentioned, you know, when you don't have that insulin in your body, your fuel builds up. The fuel is sugar. Sugar builds up and it starts depositing and destroying every cell in your body. So it affects your central nervous system, which causes stroke. So that falls into cardiovascular disease. It affects your heart, makes you have something called congestive heart failure, where your heart gets weak. And that's a different entity to a heart attack. A heart attack is a myocardial infarction where you have a blockage. So you know, poorly controlled diabetes increases your risk of developing blockages in the blood vessels that supply your heart. And that causes you to have MIs or myocardial infarctions, weaken heart. In addition to that, you know, we all have blood vessels in our neck, down our legs. So you get blockages in them. You get something called peripheral vascular disease, carotid artery disease. So it's a pretty wide spectrum. And one of the issues is, you know, typical description of somebody having a heart attack is chest pain when they walk going down the left arm. Diabetics don't typically have that presentation because if the sugars are very high and they're uncontrolled, they get something called neuropathy, which is where their nerves get damaged. So if you don't have normal nervous innervation of your heart, 
those signals are not the same as somebody without diabetes. So it's not uncommon to see a diabetic patient having a heart attack or a heart issue and just have very vague symptoms of feeling tired, more, you know, weak. And, you know, that's why it's a very difficult disease in terms of managing cardiac complications because it's not, it's not very obvious, it's very silent. You know, silent heart attacks are a common thing with extreme poorly controlled diabetics. Well, then how do you know you're having a silent heart attack if there's not many any symptoms? It is. It's very difficult. That's why you have to have a very high, uh, you know, suspicion when you see a diabetic person with nonspecific symptoms, especially if they are not controlled. If their diabetes is well controlled, if their A1C and their fasting sugars are well controlled, the chances of developing what we call macrovascular. So that's microvascular complications and macrovascular. Microvascular is your neuropathy and stuff like that. Macrovascular is heart attacks, strokes, the big blood vessels. If you are a well-controlled diabetic, the chance of macrovascular complications are much less. Whereas if I see somebody with vague symptoms and I see a very high A1C, they're not taking their medication, they're not washing their diet, my suspicion for doing a stress test or having a low threshold for a diagnostic angiogram is much higher. <clears throat> well, and I think here in the desert, we see more type 2s, uh, which is more the adult onset right. diabetes, although Sherry and I share type 1. <laughs> in fact, the, the entire board, basically, most of them are, are type, type 1, one di yeah. diabetes. And maybe we've been living with the disease so long that we have a passion for this. And we know right. that if we take better care of ourselves, yeah. we can then in turn help somebody else be take better care of themselves or encourage somebody to yeah. take better care Completely. of themselves. And, you know, it's interesting, too, because you probably see this much more than I do, because you have the, you know, your patient publishers all have diabetes. Is, do you see a difference in the, the emotional and the understanding between type 1 and type 2 patients in terms of their disease entity? Not really. Not, not a difference in understanding. It is, but the different people, it, it's the... What I notice is just mm -hmm. is the attitude coming in. Right. If they have a positive attitude, it's it's easy to understand, and they they it, it they just their understanding is there. I see. Positive attitude makes a huge, huge difference. difference, and that's a lot of what my talk is going to be about. I see. That's very interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's what I say is uh, for a person living with diabetes, we've got to take our medication, our diet. And I don't mean we're on, lose, trying to lose weight, but the food that we eat, yeah. the exercise, and having a great attitude about life. Yes. Yeah. You know, because attitude, I mean, somebody who is a normal person look, gets up and looks in the mirror every morning and says, you know, you look terrible, you feel terrible. In a week, you're going to look terrible yeah, exactly. and feel yeah. terrible. So, yeah. now, Dr. Wick, what do you suggest for people who live with diabetes about to take care of their heart? Keeping their blood sugars down. I think, you know, working <laughs> with their diabetes doctors, with the dietitian, with the diabetic education clinic to make sure that they're they know exactly what they should eat and what, should, what they should avoid eating, making sure their sugars are up to date, and then making sure their screening tests are up to date. So, you know, a lot of people do not get the appropriate retinal screening, their neuropathy screening. And then, because for most part, like I said earlier, if your sugar is well controlled, you will minimize your risk of having macrovascular complications, okay? And then, you know, seeing your primary care physician or a cardiologist every once in a while just to make sure there's been no complications is all you need. So, you know, it all comes to basically making sure your sugar is under control. Exactly. And, and we, do, we also, in our clinic, we teach the American Diabetes Association ADR. Standards of Care, which is, includes all the screenings, the time intervals, and, and we teach the patient all of that. So it is very important. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot, is, you know, a lot has to be said for exercise. Absolutely. I think, you know, it's probably the most underutilized and underestimated treatment for most conditions. You know, I've seen people do exercise, lose weight, and like gotten rid of their type 2 diabetes. You know, I've had people with A1Cs of 10, <laughs> okay? Okay, normal A1C is like around a 5.5 to Correct. 6. Exactly. Yeah. A1C is twice what it should be, which is like, you know, they're, any given day their sugars are running three, 400, okay? They've gotten into the gym, six months, lost a couple of hundred pounds, you know, kept it off, and, you know, they're cured of that type 2 diabetes. So 
I think exercise is very important, especially for the type 2 diabetics, because you know, they can make a difference to their insulin resistance from exercise. Yes. Well, now, you, can you actually cure type 2 diabetes? I think if you have diabetes that's bought, it's, it's a bit of a gray area, because if I see a person, right, with a very high A1C over a long period of time, but they have a poor lifestyle, we still label them a type 2 diabetic because they're not insulin dependent, they're on maybe metformin or something. And they, if they shed a significant amount of weight, if they are overweight and if they exercise daily, I have seen some people actually completely get off medication. So, you know, we still technically say, yes, you have higher risk of diabetes, but you are diet and exercise control. Yeah. Well, talking about a cure for diabetes, that is our medical keynote speaker's title for wow. his speech uh, on Saturday, March 3rd, here at the Annenberg Center uh, on the campus of Eisenhower Medical Center. Uh, again, we're starting at 8 o'clock in the morning with a health fair. We'll have our first speaker start at 9, and uh, I know one of our favorites is Dr. Batarze. He's a nephrologist, and you don't know what that is. It's a kidney doctor, but he brings it down just like Dr. Wick does. He doesn't talk above your head. He talks to you, and so you can understand what's going on with your body and what you need. I think his title is bring your kidneys in for 60,000 mile checkup. You like that? That's good. <laughs> That's yeah. good, okay. And then uh, Dr. Wick will be at uh, 10 a.m. And the medical keynote speaker, his name is Dr. Faoud Kandil. He's from City of Hope. And if you do some research on City of Hope, you cannot believe what they have done mm -hmm. in finding a new insulins for people with diabetes, how to manage things better. But he is, his title is, cure for type 1 diabetes. When I read that, I almost cried <laughs> because um, it's, it's been a long time coming, but anything to make us to be able to live a better, healthier life so that we can then, as I said earlier, we can help somebody else live a better life living with a diabetes. Um, so, okay, so that's um, Saturday, March 3rd, and then we will end at uh, 1230, and if you become a member of the Desert Diabetes Club, you get a free lunch on that day, so that's always fun. Now, Dr. Wick, what else would you like to share about your uh, presentation for the Day of Hope? So, you know, my focus on uh, the Day of Hope will be talking about the common complications we see in diabetics. So I'll, I'll speak a bit about the microvascular, which is basically the stuff that you don't hear much about, the neuropathies and stuff like that, and then the macrovascular, the kidney disease you get, the strokes you get, the vascular disease and the heart attacks. In addition, I think something that's recently, uh, in the last couple of years, really you know, explored is this, there's a whole lot of new medications for diabetes. And there's a few of them which has shown significant improvement cardiovascular mortality and morbidity, which means that these medications are created for diabetes, but in research trials, they've showed they actually improve long-term cardiovascular function and reduce your risk of cardiac death. You know, on the same token, there are certain old diabetic medications that people don't know about that are actually now contraindicated in people with heart failure and heart disease. So, you know, after moving here, I've seen a few patients already in the emergency room or in the hospital setting where they've got pretty advanced heart failure and they're on one or two medications which should definitely not be used for treating diabetes. Oh, interesting, okay. Yeah. Well, I, as I said, everything in anybody's body affects everything else, but yeah. especially with uh, those of us who live with diabetes, everything does affect every cell of our body and there's right. so many different complications. So Sherry, let's talk about again, what are you going to talk about at the Day of Hope? And your presentation is at 9 a.m. So my presentation is, um, it's actually going to be about our attitudes of, towards being diagnosed with diabetes and then how when patients come to see me, what I get. I get you know, imagine being diagnosed with diabetes, and it's mostly geared towards type two. And so it's, it's kind of re revolving around how diabetes kills the mood. And that's my presentation. It's all about it kills the mood and how can we change that mood. The emotional effects of it. So yeah. this, this whole 
thing with diabetes, when I first started out years ago, I was working inpatient, and I used to go to patients, and I, you know, this is a health sentence. <laughs> You just received a health sentence, right. yeah. not a death sentence, yeah. because it can be controlled. Right. There is something you can do, but people need to be educated. Exactly. And so I, that's, it's, nutrition's involved, obviously there's, it's going to be about nutrition, but it's more about the mood around it and how many myths are out there and how many people are coming to me thinking they have to do this or they have to do that. Oh, I have to do this to control my diabetes, like they have to eat something. Right, right. <laughs> you know that, that, good. that pulls on me because I'm yeah. no 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 because we're we're defeating this this poor person who's trying. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, no. Well, um, let me just go over a little more of the logistics. This day of, the Jim Cook Day of Hope for Diabetes, and let me just talk briefly about Jim. Jim was a dear friend of mine. He had type one diabetes. He and a few other friends founded the Desert Diabetes Club here at Eisenhower Medical Center, and then they started this Day of Hope for Diabetes once a year. It's totally free, open to the public. Starts at eight o'clock in the morning. There's a health fair runs all day, and then the first speaker will be at 9 a.m., Dr. Wick will be at 10 a.m., oh, Sherry will be at 9 a.m., um, and then we'll have our medical keynote speaker from the City of Hope, which is Dr., make sure make sure I get his name correctly, Fiaud Candil, and he's gonna be talking about a cure for type one diabetes. Again, it's free, totally open to the public. Please join us, find out more information, and live better with diabetes. And Absolutely. Thank you for joining me on Talk of the Desert, Dr. Wick. Thank you for Dr. Wick Aramasing. How did I do on that? Very good. But it's not the Sui Lankwa pronunciation I found out, <laughs> but I got pretty close anyway. But we lovingly call him Dr. Wick. Again, welcome to Eisenhower. We're thank thrilled to have much. you. Thank you for having me. And I think Dr. Hackshaw did a good job. I think so <laughs> thank too. You. Yeah. And thank you, audience, for joining us. For more information, email. TOTDTV at questoffice.net and visit talkofthedesert.tv on the web.